a tight ship. I'd like to call to order the work session on May 14th. It's now 4.30. We are all present this evening. We have one item on the agenda, and I'd like to remind council to refrain from asking questions until the staff presentations are complete. It's 3.1. We're going to receive a presentation regarding the status of the transit services currently offered in Goodyear. Options for senior transportation, workforce, transportation, and innovation opportunities. Our presenters are, are Rebecca Zook, our Director of Engineering, and Christine McMurray, Administrative Service Supervisor, and they will be uh, introducing the guest speaker. You're on. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm very happy to be here this afternoon uh, with some guests from uh, Valley Metro that I'll uh, introduce in just a moment. I'm also going to set the stage for tonight's presentation and uh, questions afterward. So um, again, I'd like to welcome our Valley Metro staff. We have Scott Smith, who is the CEO. We also have uh, Carol Ketcherside, the Deputy Director of Planning, as well as Rob Antoniak, the COO. And uh, beside me, we also have Christine McMurdy, as the mayor uh, mentioned, and she has been working on transit here with the city of Goodyear for over 10 years. And so, although she's not part of the uh, presentation itself, she's here to answer any questions as it relates to Goodyear. Uh, tonight's presentation is a result of um, some meetings we've had in the past. We had our budget retreat on February 5th, where transit was mentioned as well as another uh, discussion on April 9th in a budget work session where some questions were asked. And so we've attempted to gear tonight's presentation to address some of those issues as well as look into the future. So we'll start the presentation off um, looking at uh, current services and then uh, move into future considerations for council. And ultimately, after uh, the end of the council presentation, we'd be interested to see what you all might like to have us bring again forward to you in more detail, as this is more of a general topic. Great. Appreciate that. And with that, I'll hand it over to Scott Smith. Thank you. Mayor, members of the council, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be out here with you. And uh, I hope that we can have a nice discussion. And, and, and maybe you'll learn something, maybe not. Maybe you'll teach us something. We're, we're here to listen as much as we are to here to, uh, to talk, because uh, this is not a unique discussion. Uh, especially here in the West Valley, uh, where growth has come rapidly, uh, the world has changed. Certainly, in the last uh, uh, certainly in the last ten, uh, even fifteen years, and it seems like uh, uh, institutions such as transit uh, have not really kept up with the grow with the growth trends. And we hope that we can cover that a little bit and show where we are, and also where we might be headed. As has been said, uh, this right here, and, and you don't have to memorize this. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a map of our transit routes. It includes every uh, regularly scheduled transit route in the valley. Uh, as you can see there, uh, well, you may not be able to see, but, uh, but Goodyear is actually in a little inset box because uh, 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 there's two reasons. Not that you're not important, but actually this uh, basic system was established somewhere 25, 30, 35 years ago. And the backbones of our transit system still are, are carryover of that that were significantly impacted by the recession. Uh, I was uh, in, in office, I was sitting in uh, Mayor Lord's, uh, not her chair, but as, uh, as a mayor, and had the great privilege of being part in 2009, 2010, the rebalancing, uh, as, as dollars from our regional uh, uh, sales tax did not keep up. Uh, so you see that Goodyear in the, uh, in the little box, inset box, and, and here's one reason why. This is actually the, trans these are actually the transit routes that either run through or touch Goodyear. Uh, we actually only have one route that runs through Goodyear, and even that going from east to west, the northern part, and that actually is a rural route that runs uh, clear out to, uh, uh, clear down to Ajo, and comes in and, and passes through Goodyear on its way uh, into, into uh, the, the city, uh, the center. Uh, other than that, we're touched uh, basically by both uh, some, uh, some express routes on the far eastern side, northeastern side, uh, a fixed route that comes into the uh, dips in a couple, three miles, uh, uh, Route 17, and then the uh, uh, and then the circulator uh, that uh, through Avondale and it runs along the uh, the eastern part of the city. So you can see that even though we're at the sort of the fringe of the transit area, even that we're barely being uh, being touched. 
And that creates, uh, that creates uh, some, some challenges as we talk about transit. Um, even with that, though, we looked at uh, the uh, yearly boardings and weekday boardings are increasing. Part of that is because we found that, you know, when you add routes, when you add frequency, more people ride. They have more available to them. And there's no doubt that as we've, as we've added the, uh, the Zoom circulator uh, uh, coverage, and also we added one express route that uh, but more people rode. Now, one of the things that we, we know is, shows that transit is, is needed here is that the park and ride, which is there on the far eastern side of the city, is the, is the most effective and efficient in the entire West Valley, nearly 80% full on a given day. And that's actually quite good for park and rides. Uh, we range from anywhere from 5 and 10% efficiency uh, to some in the Southeast Valley up to, once again, 80% is being used. Uh, people have asked now what, uh, and I understand you were interested, how many of those are, are actually Goodyear residents? Well, actually about 40% of those who use transit routes in Goodyear, and that includes the park and ride, which is right on the border, are Goodyear residents. The other come from the adjoining communities, uh, and that also includes people get off in Goodyear and then may go on to other places. But um, there are those who rely on transit, who use it primarily, to get into uh, to Phoenix through express routes and into the adjoining communities headed primarily to the east. Uh, the big thing that is, is change and will change, continue to change, especially in communities such as Goodyear, are, are paratransit. Um, federal law requires paratransit to be provided within three quarters of a mile of any established regularly scheduled route. Well, because uh, there are a few regularly established routes in Goodyear, your area where you're required to offer uh, um, paratransit services, and only to those that are ADA qualified, um, is not very big as in relation to the entire city footprint or even the, uh, the people who live there. Uh, but even at that, it is used. We have 117 ADA certified individuals, and certified in order to, to qualify, you have to go in, and we have a, uh, an actual process that we run through with, with established cert uh, Certifiers or certificators? I guess they're certifiers. Go to the mobility center. For Go to the mobility center. They run you through some tests because there are very strict uh, standards in the federal law that says what that is. And those are the those are those who who qualify for for uh, uh, for paratransit. Now, in the ruck across the valley, nearly every city sets their own guidelines and rules for coverage for uh, for paratransit. As I've mentioned, you're only required by law to do ADA, uh, uh, ADA that, that means a stated disability under federal law within three quarters of a mile of, of the route. That would, in this one, be primarily three quarters from the eastern border and then wherever Route 17 uh, comes in, three quarters of a mile of that. Other areas in the valley, uh, the city councils have, ag have agreed or decided to provide paratransit availability to, uh, for the entire city, even those areas that are outside the three quarters. Some cities in the county have decided to provide it to seniors also, even though they're not required to by law. They've decided to do that. I will tell you that this is, uh, this is, these are decisions that are, that are hard because when you don't have transit services and you want to provide that, but there are also decisions that there is more than one city council in this valley that is now looking very carefully at decisions they made years ago because the budget ramifications and the fact that paratransit is an on-demand service. It's not like a regular scheduled. I can tell you how much it costs to run a bus. I can't tell you exactly what it will cost you to run paratransit, especially as you see the purple lines there are the uh, 2000, fiscal year 2018 riders. And you can see is there, there has been a very large uh, increase in, in paratransit. Something else changed uh, just recently, and that's in the last two years. The region decided to provide regional paratransit services. There, there used to be about seven different zones because of the way paratransit services developed over the years. And literally, if you were going from Mesa to Phoenix, you would, they would drive you to the boundary for the East Valley zone, which was Mesa, Tempe, Chandler, Gilbert, stop, and you'd have to wait for a Phoenix paratransit to come and pick you up. You'd get out of one car, get onto the other, and then they'd take you on. Starting in July of 2016, that changed. The region decided to offer regional paratransit. You could actually cross boundaries in one car. Uh, this is a challenge that we now have because you can imagine when you offer a service, people have a tendency to use that. What that means is that ridership goes up uh, as it has in, in, uh, in, in Goodyear. You can see the regional paratransit trips have gone up. 
But another thing, uh, another thing that's interesting is that uh, in, in Goodyear, the average regional paratransit trip is 29 miles. That is, uh, that's a long way to travel. Here's the kicker. We can only charge 200% of the stated full fare bus fare. That's $2. So we charge $4 for paratransit regardless of where you're going. That 28 mile trip actually, uh, the region probably subsidizes it by up to $60. Our average subsidy on the region for paratransit is almost $40. A lot of that is driven by, uh, by uh, this regional and the, and the ability for someone to now go across city lines and go across zones to, to, to everywhere else. So that's a real challenge we have and it's a decision that as our population certainly ages, as we grow together as, as a region and the demand is there, it's something we will work closely with you in making that decision because there are, once, as you know, once you provide a service, it's very difficult to roll it back. We have some options that we'll be talking to you about. One of the things I want to tell you that even though uh, we have all these costs, Goodyear actually plays out pretty well and that is a stroke of luck because the contract that we entered into actually does not uh, really gives you a, 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 almost a flat fare and, and um, in essence those who have longer trips get the benefit of the terms of this contract. So you're paying less than other cities that, that, that are on, a, on, on an average. Uh, that, is, that, that will change as we go through the terms and the, and the time. Uh, it won't be this year, it might be two years from now, three years from now, as these, these realities come in and, and, we, and we start to equalize the terms of the contract so that, so that cities bear the cost in a fair manner and, and basically the same across the region. Right now that's not the case. Goodyear is the beneficiary of that, of the terms of the contract, right? As you can see, uh, the cost, even though the ridership has gone up, the length of the trip uh, is long, the actual relative cost uh, for, uh, for Goodyear has held fairly steady and, and certainly has not increased along with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the amount of, of, uh, of ridership. Which brings us to the question, how is funding currently, uh, uh, how is transit currently funded in Goodyear? The, base of, the basis of our funding in this region, and especially in, in the city of Goodyear, our regional Proposition 400. This is our half cent sales tax. Uh, this tax has been, in, uh, uh, has been in place since 2005. It has a 20 year term, which means it will expire in December of 2025. Prior to that, Prop 300, which built the freeways, did not have a transit component. Prop 400 does have a transit. One third of the funds that are collected uh, in the half cent sales tax are dedicated to transit. A portion of that goes to light rail uh, capital costs and the rest go to, uh, to fund the, ba the, bare, the, the basics and the foundation of a regional transit system, including the services that we have in, in Goodyear. There's uh, the only amount that the state gives to us was something that the court uh, decided. It's about a little over $10 million uh, in state lottery funds that are, that, are, that are passed through Valley Metro and go out to the individual cities. Uh, we have cities who decide to supplement, including Goodyear a bit, with local funds out of their general fund or whatever they have, whether they have a dedicated tax or whatever. Some cities like Tempe and Phoenix, that amount is tens of millions of dollars out of a dedicated tax. In Mesa, they don't have a dedicated tax, so they, they cut money out of their general fund. Other cities pay nothing besides what is available in, in that. So each city can decide how much they put in. And then Goodyear and Avondale are in a federal subzone uh, for the, uh, 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 because it's a, it's a sub-metro area. So you're eligible for some federal funds that come into the area um, because of the, your designation. Something which will change uh, as, we, as we've grown and in the next year or two will, will change. Uh, this is a summary of the different routes in Goodyear and how they're paid for. Uh, you can see, I'll just take the first one, the Zoom. Uh, that is uh, designated as a circulator. We do not pay regional funds for circulators. There are several circulators we run in the valley in different cities, so uh, the Zoom is one of them. You have a local total, total of 150,000 of which most of that is paid for out of your federal allocation, uh, which is a matching. And, uh, and then uh, you can see that the region as a whole pays almost $2 million. And we say the region, that means the combination of all the different cities. And since you just have a small little portion of that, uh, both Tolleson and Avondale, who's, who bears the majority of the cost of that, choose 
other sources of funds and direct sources of funds. We have other things, for example, on, uh, on your, your uh, let's go down to your express bus. The express bus is paid for almost exclusively by the region, our express service is, because we serve different uh, people from different communities. That's Route 562 on the bottom. You can see that, uh, that Goodyear uh, pays only $1,400 directly, and with the federal match, $2,800 a year. And yet, uh, between, uh, it costs us over, uh, over a quarter million dollars, about $270,000 to run that. So this is a combination of all these different sources of funds coming into the same, the same uh, uh, pool, same bucket. Now, the federal allocation that I'm, I'm saying, that is, is because you're in a subzone with Avondale, you've outgrown that. And with the next census, that funding will go away. So within the next, in the next three or four years, you'll be, you'll be able to use some of those funds for capital goods, buying equipment, but you cannot use those for operations. <coughs> so that money will disappear over the next, what, Carol, three years or, or so? I think the next three years, four years at maximum. A couple years after the census. Yeah, so the next three, three to four years, that money will, will disappear and will not, will not be able to be used. So um, it, as you can see, uh, the, 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 these Prop 400 funds and contributions from other cities pay the bulk of the services, the bulk of the, of, of the monies that, uh, that uh, for the services Goodyear receives, which is reasonable because you don't have the bulk of the line in, in your, and the bulk of the service, even though your residents uh, are available. So the big question I'm always asked, and then we'll, we'll stop and take some questions, uh, from West Valley especially is, well, how do I increase my service? Uh, the West Valley has grown, and, and one thing that was done in Prop 400 when it was passed is it was, there was an agreement made among all the cities in the valley that we would lock in allocation formulas based on the population in 2004 and that those would not be adjusted over the 20 year term. That was done, there was a reason for that uh, and, and so what happens is that the West Valley, everyone knew the West Valley would, would, would uh, experience the bulk of the growth but that was the deal. Most of the monies went to freeways and roadways, the building 303, uh, widened the I-10 and things like that and the West Valley proportionally took a smaller proportion of, of transit funds. So what that means is that we lack service, as you know. In order to increase service, because we're in a 20-year plan that's been fixed, we would, eat, we would have to develop funding from a new source, usually from the city. So whether we're talking to Surprise or Queen Creek or whoever it is who was one of these fast, or Goodyear, who's a fast growing guy, I say, here's what it will cost, and you can see the cost of of routes, Route 3, about a million dollars. A, a fixed route is about 750000 a million dollars minimum for, the, for a basic fixed route. That <coughs> Route 17 is a very long route, which is why it costs more. Uh, and that money would have to come from a source that is not current, presently, because we simply don't have the money in, coming in in the Prop 400. Uh, over the term of our life of, our, of Prop 400, we're running well over a billion dollars short because of the recession. Uh, we'll only end up getting about 60% of the monies that were anticipated uh, in, in Prop 400. And so at that, I'll, I'll certainly uh, uh, um, entertain any questions you might have about the basics of where we are in Goodyear. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll do that. And then after the questions, we'll I'll turn it over to, to Carol. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll call you mayor because that's what I'm used to calling right. you. And Thank I guess you. once a mayor, always a mayor. That's doesn't right. matter what your title is. All right, uh, council, so uh, we're ready for... You have nothing else that you need to add to this, right? Thank you, Mayor and Council. There are um, additional slides after this, but this might be a good stopping point if there are any questions about what's been presented thus far. Great, thank you. Any questions? Councilman Vasillo. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, in about three to four years, an estimate, the funding source that currently is being used to fund our transportation or dry up, is that what I'm understanding, or significantly drop? America, it won't dry up. It'll just, it'll be restricted in how it can be used. Okay. Those monies will still come in, but they can be, they would have to be used for capital uh, items and not for operations. How much are we getting to operate what we have right now? I yeah, think I'm got sorry, to Mayor, this. Council. Um, Actually, the the local well the the local funds that uh, Scott was referring to, we actually match all of our transit funds with the lottery funds. We have substantial amount of lottery funds available, so that any of the service that we have that requires a local match, we rely on the lottery funds to pay it. So, regarding the urbanized area funds, 
Um, that will expire in 2020. The federal government gives us the option of extending it for an additional two years. And then we do expect, at least what we are hearing from Maricopa Association of Governments is based on our current population figures and projections for growth, they will likely extend the urbanized area into the next census, so an additional 10 years, but we will not receive operating funds, we'll only receive capital funds. So we'll still be required to match anything that we spend on capital, but we currently have some operating funds and those will expire. That's the only source of funds that will expire, is the operating funds for the urbanized area that Scott was mentioning. And right now, the Goodyear federal allocation, if you can look at the schedule, 150, about $325,000 is the amount that's, where that's coming in from there. The lottery funds do not expire. Okay, so, so if, I, if I'm understanding correctly, about 300,000 plus is what we'll have to make up out of some funding source in three we have, years? We have sufficient funding for that. Anything we lose at this point, it, especially in that dollar amount, we have sufficient lottery funds to, to hold that up. We're not gonna be at a loss at all. So we don't have to worry about coming up with an alternative funding source of any kind, That's correct. operations or whatever. Time, currently for our current transportation services, okay. that is correct. Okay, thank you. That was cool. uh, Sherry? Uh, thank you very much. Um, my question is obviously, it's exactly what you just said about what I hear most from people is I would love to leave my car at home and be able, especially if they work downtown or in the East Valley, because you guys drove on I-10, I'm sure you carpooled it down here if you could. That's just not a good road um, for commuting. Um, with the light rail, at one time I remember it was supposed to go to 75th Avenue with a park and ride, and that right now that's, where is that? Because that would be a good, at least, park and ride for our people to connect in with that. Yeah, there, in, the, in the plan, there is a, there, there is a, a plan to uh, have a high capacity corridor uh, from basically the capital area out to 79th Avenue that would run along the, the uh, the I-10 corridor, there's a, there's a high capacity. I use a high capacity because it hasn't been actually determined whether that's going to be bus rapid transit okay. or, or rail. That'll depend on a lot of factors. No, it'll depend on one factor, money. And uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, City of Phoenix is doing some studies on uh, bus rapid transit. We have been looking at that corridor uh, and there will be a major transit center at 79th Avenue and the freeway, uh, whether excuse me, how you ride from there into the downtown area will just depend upon what kind we were at. Now, the, now, when I say bus rapid transit, it's not just like an express bus. It'll be a dedicated lane. It'll be basically light rail on, on rubber is what it'll be. Uh, and that's, that's probably not going to happen until uh, for another eight, seven to ten years at the earliest uh, based on how the project, that's on, that's on a fast scale. Yeah. So. Yeah, and like I said, that's what I hear the most is people would love to have another alternative rather than get it on the freeways, the 303. So I was wondering what those options would be for our people at that point. But and and like that's only the 79th Avenue because that's what the city of Phoenix, how they allocated their funds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, depending upon we're gonna get into whatever Prop 500, whatever the successor of Prop 400 is, is, is going to be, uh, that then could be an opportunity for West Valley City to decide to move that even further to the west. Uh, the reason it stops at 79th Avenue is that, is that the city of Phoenix Funded. Uh, it stops at their city limit, basically. Oh, okay, thank you. Joanne? Well, thank you. Um, I think this, I, I really appreciate the data and showing you know, what Goodyear is receiving and, and uh, what it's costing. I think my question, though, is to Christine. So knowing we have that park and ride digital billboard that those funds directly were for <coughs> either transit or roadways in some manner, um, I don't know how much we use of that currently, how much is still sitting in savings. What Can you refresh my memory about Mayor, that? Mayor, Council Member Osborne, thank you, because I'm sitting here thinking, oh, I forgot to mention the digital marquee. Um, the marquee that's located at the park and ride is sitting on FTA land. Right. So the funds that we receive, the revenue from the advertising, and then the upfront agreement that we had with, I think it was Clear Channel, um, de uh, stipulates that we can only use that for transit. So currently, um, I believe there's $500,000 for capital only. And then uh, I did check on that today. There's roughly a little over $90,000 in revenue from advertising that is also sitting in, in our accounts right now because we have not stipulated a purpose for it. And that is another revenue source that will continue to grow because it has a restriction that it will only be used for transit services. 
so so another um, of all these years that we've had it and we've been receiving annual rental fees for lack of better words um, I thought it was quite a bit more annually than that or are we already allocating some towards something currently that fund has not been used for transit purposes so it since it doesn't expire it's continuing to grow and the, the whole idea being we we were waiting for the mall to begin uh, we were waiting for more activity centers as you all know the rev, uh, the recession kind of slowed our growth down you really don't want to start and operate transit without major activity centers that being the case it's in the city's best interest to sit on those funds until we have uh, a reason to grow transit and we're in an excellent situation right now where you have various options available that we can expand and expand safely with some restrictions in place so that we don't overextend ourselves like uh, mr. Smith mentioned we don't want to make decisions that we're going to regret later and I'm going to actually ask them to move forward with the next part of the presentation because you all brought up a few very uh, important points during the budget retreat that we would like to discuss with you that'll give you some of those options before we do I'm gonna stop Joanna and answer the questions because they're very quickly let's get out the ones okay. we have where we go on because let's try to make them concise yeah the quick things people bring up sometimes in good year that uh, the railroad along MC 85 is that would that ever be a possible commuter rail uh, mayor uh, councilmember Hampton there are numerous studies on, on commuter rail uh, running along both the uh, BNSF uh, the yeah. east-west along 85 on Grand Avenue on Rittenhouse out in the southeast those are all possibilities uh, they once again as far as the long term and whatever the next uh, uh, the next transportation fund I'm sure that'll be a part of it the biggest challenge we have there is that those are owned by Union Pacific and Burlington Northern and they like their rails and they don't share them very easily don't like the so there's been a lot of discussions for a lot of years of the potential yes that's a possibility but uh, until there's a funding source we haven't had really serious discussions yeah. and that funding source does not exist and won't exist until uh, until this is either renewed or some other Regional. funding source comes in okay thank you all right and then the second thing was we don't have you guys have anything to do with dial ride or is that a totally separate service we'll get there. okay when we say paratransit it's synonymous with dial ride for us so yes we do yeah, no, dial right and paratransit are. I guess you're on, Willie. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, my questions, uh, I'm, I'm going to give this to Rebecca to get back to us because I want to know, please, what the balance is of the, all the lottery funds. I want to know the totals and not that we just can spend and we don't have to worry, but I'd like to know how much money we have. Sure. And I'd like to know the exact allocation that we do get. I understand um, of us paying part of it. Uh, I get all that. Uh, I have been told that, uh, and I don't know that this is true, but that Arizona doesn't get all of the transportation monies it has coming from the federal government because a lot of it is a match, and a lot of times we don't want to match. And I don't know if, in fact, that's true, but I'd like to know if that's true. And then also I'd like to add my two cents in. If we do do a Proposition 500, I would hope that the West Valley mayors are very vocal that we need transit out here and we don't want to uh, uh, be the stepchildren again like we are in Prop 400 because all of us are paying for that but we're really not getting a benefit out of it and we can't afford to bring light rail out here because uh, light rail is just um, just too expensive and but I'll address that need... briefly in the latter parts of the of the presentation We've yeah we just need we some that. nice transportation for our residents and, and, and you're right, we are 29 miles away from everything. So it is what it is, but we just need to, to work that. But we need to know basically how much money we have and, and right. how much all together, because just telling us we can spend and not worry, I want to see the money, please. Thank you. Well, first of all, aren't we smart? Aren't we smart on those signs? Yeah. Look what we've done. Yeah. No matter what you say here and you're worried about the amount, I think you need to get that to them, but I'm going to say, we were brilliant and we're going to continue to think that way I will tell you on West Valley mayors we get together all the time we're getting together with the city managers we're talking about this we will not have light rail 
There's not a, none of the West Valley cities want that. Mm -hmm. It isn't going to be workable. What we need is transit and paratransit and all the other names that they name. And just so, and, and we were at the legislature, uh, just so you know, there are no plans to bring light rail to the West right. Valley. Right. Uh, light rail works where it is and it accomplishes certain goals. Uh, there are no, no, nowhere in the West Valley does that formula work. No. And so it'll be spent on other so, things. So two mayors have confirmed that tonight. Yes. So. All right, let's go on with the next <laughs> part of the briefing. Go ahead. Thank you, um, Mayor Lord, members of the council. We heard from your staff that there are three topics that you would like to hear a little more about, and I'm gonna spend some time talking about senior transportation, about your workforce access to jobs, and then I'm gonna turn it back over to Scott, who's gonna talk a little bit about emerging technologies. So with respect to seniors, although there is no federal requirement that you provide specific transportation for seniors, it is, as Scott said, it is something that some communities choose to do. Um, we also understand that there are uh, a couple of developments that you have an interest in providing services to uh, with some challenges in terms of distance from the city and also in which car ownership is high. So we're gonna talk about some options for that in, in just a bit. Well here are the options. Um, <laughs> some of the potential service options that we wanna talk about with you, one is ride choice, and we're gonna, we have a whole slide on ride choice in a little bit. Microtransit is a sort of a new concept which, um, in which it, we have uh, demand responsive service that picks up people in, in less dense neighborhoods and brings them to a more dense transit hub to connect them to the rest of transit. So that's something that is potentially an option for your future. Oops, so went one too far. And then circulator service, which is much like the Zoom that you have now. Um, that is probably the most expensive of all the things that we're talking to you here tonight, but is definitely an option for you. Um, you've told us that there are large employers in the area and many more on the way, and, and we understand that. The challenge with these facilities is that they are really large warehouses that are surrounded by seas of parking, and they're set back far from the roads. Uh, it, and that makes it very difficult to serve it with fixed route, with traditional fixed route transit um, in a, in a cost-effective and efficient manner. Uh, fixed route transit really thrives on density. So we took a look at the density. Um, that's, that, uh, is, that the employment in Goodyear is showing. And, and this map shows, this little kind of a heat map shows density of employment in Goodyear. The densest areas that you see there are the yellow, which is less than 2,000 jobs per square mile. Now this is typical of large warehouse types of employment centers. If you compare that region wide to the density of, of jobs, you see that some of those hot spots that are showing up there in red those are up to 3,500 jobs per square mile, which is 75% more dense than what you have in Goodyear. Um, as the mayor said, it is what it is. Uh, fixed route transit, of course, thrives, as I said, on, on density, both in the origin and the destination of, the, of where people are traveling. So you can see that fixed route transit serving medium density employment is a bit of a challenge. <clears throat> on the origin side of the equation, we also looked at where people are living that are going to your employment centers. So this is just one example. This is your Amazon center. And even at the densest concentration, there are less than 10 employees per square mile going to Amazon to go to work. So that, you can see where we have a challenge with that. The good news is that there are some solutions to these challenges. We have a very robust van pool program at Valley Metro. It's very successful. Um, it is, uh, it, it serves groups of six to 15 commuters and it is very affordable and it is 100% adaptable to the needs of those who are using it. It's, it's a growing uh, program and we would love to have people come and talk to you or your employers all about that. We, we feel like that's a very strong solution to some of the challenges we have here. <clears throat> But out of all the information that we provided tonight, we believe Ride Choice is probably the most of the most interest to you. Um, the Ride Choice program ser provides service to seniors and those with disabilities. It operates wherever taxis operate, uh, operates when taxis operate. <clears throat> no advanced booking is required. And um, th there's a lot of flexibility for the cities to choose how they want this program to work in their city. 
We do have a request for proposals out on the street right now. Uh, we have a, a contract that's expiring and we'll be issuing a new contract. Some of the new features of the new contract is that we will, we, we intend to make use of Lyft and Uber type services for this and also there will be a, a smartphone app. Robin Toniak is here to answer some of your questions on that if, if you have those. And just so you know, one of the things that we've really noticed recently in, in transportation, uh, and especially affects uh, communities such as Goodyear, is the impact that Uber and Lyft have had. The biggest impact in the, in, the, in the dense city is that people take Uber and Lyft for their short rides. The impact it's had on you is that the availability of taxi service is being diminished as taxis sort of migrate to more dense areas where they can get uh, co consistent rides and they vacate less dense areas because Uber and Lyft have now filled in because of the nature of part-time uh, drivers who choose when they want to work and so there's, there's this constant pool of drivers who don't re rely upon a lot of fares. That's created challenges for us because we need a consistent mm -hmm. firm uh, uh, pool of both vehicles and drivers. But it's also created opportunities and we are currently in discussion with Lyft, for example, on how we can integrate them into our system. And I'll talk a little bit about that more as we get along. So this slide shows the future transit network as it appears in the MAG Regional Transit Framework Study. Um, it's overlaid onto your employment density map. Now this map is admittedly based on current technology and the current models for delivering transit service. Uh, we feel that in 2040, which is what this is, transit is not likely to look like it looks like today. So we think there are a lot of new technologies out there and I'm gonna turn this back over to Scott to talk to you about what some of those look like. Good, thank you. And, and as, as we were looking at this, we, we tried to think about what it would be like uh, as we're looking 20 plus years out to 2040. And you know, MAG and others did these kind of studies 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to change, now what has happened in the 20 years? Well, actually not a whole lot. Cars change, but service models haven't changed for literally decades. And then 2007 hit. 2007 is a pivotal year. What happened in 2007? Steve Jobs stood in front of a crowd and introduced something called the iPhone. And I'll have to say that only Steve Jobs fully understood that. They said, no, that thing is really an ugly phone. And he said at that time, and I remember, I think he was probably the only one in the world who said, you don't get it. The phone will be a secondary use of this in the future. This has the power of opening up the world to everybody. Everyone looked at him, they had no clue what he was talking about. Now we get it, we understand. So just think, in the last even 10 years, what's happened? 2007, uh, the, uh, the iPhone came out. Just recently, Uber and Lyft have come out. And now the most important thing is autonomous vehicles. We talked about these micro transit and things like that, and this is the thing, these are the kinds of things that I think are exciting for a community like Goodyear. Carol was right, we don't know what transit's gonna look like, but we know public transportation is gonna be here. Uh, because not everyone's going to own a car. And even if we go with autonomous uh, driven cars, what studies have shown is that certainly it, 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 it reduces congestion, some by up to 25, 30%. We also found that it increases the number of vehicle miles traveled by, guess what, 25 to 30%. So we may not gain anything from your ability to get from here to there, especially in long distances. There's no doubt that things such as these microbuses that have come in microtransit, which capability exists now, uh, will change transit, especially in a place like, uh, like Goodyear. Why? Those cost a lot less than one of our buses do. The other thing is, if they don't have a driver on there, then, uh, the, uh, then the cost goes down even more. The other thing is this on-demand service, as, it, as it, can be, it can be ordered up with a smartphone, coordinates can be driven, and it can drive to your place wherever and take you wherever. Or you can have circulators out in the neighborhood a lot more and you just order it on demand. Autonomous vehicles are, are, are another thing. Uh, you know, what you, what you have is, you still have the human element, the availability, but the fact of the matter is, is that those will change the way we carry people, which is exciting for Goodyear because places that we could not reach with a fixed route or a circulator because of their cost, all of a sudden, I believe, in five, 10, maybe 15 years, you'll see this type of capability. The capability exists now, we just have to perfect it. We also know that bike share, if you've, been, if you've driven around anywhere, one of the biggest challenges is not will people use bikes, it's my gosh, I can't believe they're leaving all these bikes on sidewalks and everything. The ability to have a bike be, uh, be tracked by GPS, pick it up anywhere, drop it off anywhere, even scooters 
Uh, if you, uh, the most recent thing is people buying these motorized scooters, and you can do those like you do a, a, a bike share out there. You have th those that are on docks, those that are on dockless. The other thing is that we're working to integrate those into our transit. So, for example, if you took, a, uh, if you took the express bus from uh, Goodyear into Phoenix, but let's say you don't, wor you don't work within walking distance of the end of, the, of the, uh, the express, so you're not really that excited about walking eight blocks, ten blocks, We'll set it up where you can actually schedule your, your bike at the end, get off, ride your bike out, leave it there, and come back. Or you'll be able to schedule your Uber or Lyft. I envision transit will be high-capacity corridors, such as what you saw in the, uh, in the MAG study, with these micro, uh, and micro uh, uh, transit, these autonomous vehicles, taking people to those hubs, those stations, which then, if you want to go to a long distance, you want to go to your local fries, you can get on one of those and it'll take you there. If you want to go into downtown Phoenix, it'll take you right to the, right to the, uh, to the uh, uh, transit station, whatever, wherever that is, and you'll ride on that high capacity in, and something will be waiting for you when you get in there, so you don't need a car to do that. Where are we? This is just for, for information. Uh, this is what's called the levels of autonomy. You can see a zero, human only, that, that's the 1969 Chevy pickup that I learned to drive in, three on the tree, vinyl seats in Arizona, AM radio, you know, uh, the roll down the window uh, manual. You're aging yourself. You got it. I am. I am. Uh, up to number five, which is no human full autonomy. We are right now, we have the capability of five. We're operating at number four uh, in, uh, in Tempe and Chandler primarily with, uh, with uh, um, uh, Waymo and until recently with Uber, but there are others that are operating on the streets. About two months ago, GE, or GE, GM, petitioned the Department of Transportation to build cars without steering wheels or pedals. Mm -hmm. We're at level five right now, technologically. We're not there safety-wise and acceptance-wise, but we're ready there. So this is not too, too much in the distant future, and this will really have an impact on that. Now, how does it work? As I've said, this is our, for example, our light rail. There will other be, there will also be high capacity transit. You see Goodyear right out there with their high capacity. And I can see that you have hundreds, if not thousands, of these micro cars and autonomous and the Ubers and the Lyfts taking people to those and bringing them in. We believe that's the future, and that's what long-term you'll see has happened. Right. Valley Metro will be there with you to help plan for this. Uh, we don't know what it'll look like. We know it'll be different, and we know where we're headed, and we are actively pursuing opportunities in these areas, so we're not, uh, we're not caught off guard. So we can help you to fulfill your transit Thank you. Uh, average. How can you do that? We talked a lot about Prop 500, as I've said. This is something that's going to be a big topic of discussion. It already has started. Over the next two to three years, we'll be putting together the regional transit plan. And yes, the number one thing we hear from communities all over the valley is we want more transit. Uh, our freeway system, there is important freeways, the State Route 30. But for the most part, as Eric Anderson from X said, we are done building freeways, except for State Route 30, 24 on the East Valley. And, may, and on that, we're going to maintain what we have. And, uh, and, and yet we're going to find new places to move the million plus people that are going to come into this valley in the next 15 years. And they're going to live in places like Goodyear and want to go others. We've got to prepare for the loss of federal operating funds, and I'm not talking about only yours. I'm talking about in Washington, there's less and less money available to come out to, to fund uh, our transit operation. We have to prepare as a region to do that. We have to see how we can develop new local funds. Some communities have dedicated transit taxes. Others don't. Whatever it is, we know that with less money coming in from the feds, no money coming in from the state, other than this pass through this lottery, we're going to be looked upon to take care of ourselves more and more in the future. And we are also going to have to look to, to create new partnerships, especially with major employers, to see how we can fund the opportunities in the future. So thank you very much for your time. We'll now Welcome. Uh, Let's answer get on the last part of the questions here. So who's first? Bill? Scott, Carol. Rob, thank you for being here tonight. Um, you, you know, everything that, uh, that we have heard this evening, uh, none of it is from my short time on Valley Metro is, um, it's, it's not new. And if I've been doing a lot of research offline from Valley Metro on microtransit and, um, and that, is truly the future of where things are going. The idea of bus services, and I mean, we've all talked about it. Um, it it's just, we, 
our community is not built around public transportation. So I think it's exciting for us to be thinking about um, microtransit, about bringing people from Estrella to a bus line. Uh, there's a couple of services that are starting up nationwide that are starting starting to do that. So I think we've got some really unique opportunities for us to um, to look at the future in a much different way than the traditional bus and rail that I think you know we're all we're all at. So I'm excited about what the future um, you know has has to offer for us. Obviously, funding is always an issue, but um, I, I think we may have down the horizon a uh, an opportunity to ask our residents how they want to pay for it. Thank you, Jerry. I'm thank you again because uh, the microtransit got me very excited because um, that's exactly what I would like to see is somewhere that we can bring our residents in and somehow hook them in. That's what I was talking about. If we could hook them into the, the rest of the line so that they could go to Scottsdale or to the Mesa Art Centers or go to ASU and get to live in Goodyear. And I think that would be great. I truly think, I have a 15 and a half year old son who's gonna be getting his learner's permit in the next month. I think he is probably the last generation that will drive as we know it today, honestly. Um, so I think we have to look at our transportation plan and I'm sure you all would help us as we rework that because I think what we have now, the plan that we have in place with the changes in technology, I think we need to come together with our residents, however we're going to do this, and say what do we want because when that money comes, we need to make sure we have a plan and how we're going to fund it. So I think we may have to look at other funding sources because it's not going to be cheap, but we need to have this to grow. So thank you very much, and this was a great presentation. I, I agree with you, Sherry. I think uh, we've done all these citizens groups in the past. We did the city center, we've done water, we've done safety, we've done everything you write. Uh, let's let's bring them in before we have to make hardcore decisions. Mayor Lord, if I might, there's there's one thing that I would, would you need to be very much aware of, and that with this new technology, there's somewhat of an ominous uh, um, cloud of conversation over public transportation. Yeah. I've been in many meetings where people say you are going to be irrelevant. Mm -hmm. There's going to be no need for public transportation ten years from now. Yeah. Uh, and 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 that is scary because people will not will cease to invest. I, there's no doubt that public transportation will look very different. There's also no doubt that the private sector in a lot of these things, I mean, look at our paratransit. How much I tell you we are subsidizing for each ride, $40, $41? It is truly a public service. And there is no way that this can be totally, all of transportation needs can be totally taken over by the private, private sector. Uh, and so there will be a need for public transportation. It will be integrated with private services. It will be automated. It will be different. But there's a lot, there's, in a lot of conversations, there are those who say, we're, let's stop investing. Let's not do this because we're, it's going to be irrelevant. And that's sort of a scary thought going forward. Well, we'll keep that conversation going. Uh, Joanne? Thank you. Uh, just to add on to your, your thoughts there, Sherry, because it's true about planning and, and the transportation plans that we've had in the past, but also this, uh, for a city of ours that's only, you know, even saying 12% built out is, is, you know, stretching it. But um, that is something within our general plan that we continually, you know, every five years, it's now something that we need to bring in because, yes, in the past it was um, planned by the car, but maybe the new item that needs to be in the general plan is going to be, you know, the micro transit and how we, we work that together. Um, so my follow-up question I was going to ask you, Christine, was, and as you're getting um, the figures that, that Wally had asked for, is what is the, the general revenue from the billboards annually? That's what I was going to ask. Um, and also, I'm very interested, because as you were showing the, the hot spots and the data that's current, we know for our city within four years, you know, that's blown out of the water. The amount of, of jobs that are coming that we've already approved, ah, I'm throwing my pen, that we've already approved is, is incredible. And so I would think that starting the conversation now with those um, industries, even, uh, Mayor, when you have your, your industry roundtables, you know, talking to them now, how can we start a van pool service for you? You know, because I think that will be, will really be beneficial. Um, and even to the cor corporations that are looking at coming to Goodyear, being able to offer that as, hey, you know, this is something that, you know, we're really behind and, and want to help you, you know, move people. So anyway, I just, I, th I throw that out there also. Thanks. Thank you. Wally? 
Uh, are you planning on, on stopping paratransit since you're uh, talking about microtransit? Or are you going to do it in conjunction the word with it? Go ahead, Ron. So we're not stopping paratransit. Paratransit, <clears throat> as Scott touched on, we are not stopping paratransit. Yeah. <laughs> Never would paratransit as required by... Are you, are you, no, we are, are not, not stopping, stopping paratransit. <laughs> Sorry. Make that clear. <clears throat> I used to say in political campaigns, there's the rule of threes, and no, I'm not running for office either. Um, so the paratransit um, services that we do offer today are based on that three-quarter mile rule that Scott uh, talked about, right. uh, the federal law that says, by the way, basically, by the way, the crow flies. If there is a bus route, uh, let's say Goodyear did not have a bus route, but there was one that ran down Dysart. Goodyear would be responsible for the people within three-quarters of a mile of that route. So that's, that stays put. Um, I think that the place for Goodyear to think about is mobility as a service is a term that you're starting to see resonate. And we've got some transit agencies that are peer agencies that are moving towards mobility as a service. So it's not come to the transit agency and look at it and say, I need a bus or I need a train. It's I need to go from here to there, provide or show me the best way to do that. And so some of the things that we're talking about, I know we're limited on time tonight, but we can come back and dive in with you are could we do pilots with Lyft? So rather than providing a bus service, for example, a Lyft ride, if I, and I mean, um, Council, Councilwoman Loretano stated she's got a 15 and a half year old. I chose not to get a third car in the house. I've got a 16 and a half year old that's sitting waiting for me like a chauffeur out here after this meeting tonight <laughs> because of that. But I took the bus in this morning, the 562, standing room only, and I rode out here with Scott. Now he has to ride back lonely. but. We need to be thinking about mobility as a service. So it, it's not hard. It's not impossible. I would challenge anybody on the west side that says I can't get to work because it's not convenient. I mean, here I am. I'm going to take three, four modes today. Walk, you know, get in two different types of cars and take a bus. So it is possible. And the cost of grabbing a Lyft or an Uber is a lot cheaper, which I've done after an evening affair, needing to come from the east side of town to home. And it was 40 bucks. Well, that's a lot cheaper than $1,000 a month in car payment, you know, 16-year-old insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So Uber, Lyft um, ride and can enter into that space with ride choice. So as we get to the new contract that we will launch December 1st, uh, we'll be transitioning into a new contract. We'll be able to couple on top of the existing taxi cab environment other types of services that are out there. So I'm excited to talk about that. I think if if... If you all, mayor and, and council and staff, uh, I think if I were uh, to be in your shoes, which you know I have, you have an opportunity to, to be a leader in this space in the West Valley to say, you know what, maybe the traditional isn't the best route yeah. for us because that is a costly endeavor. And so I would challenge you when you're talking to your constituents and they say, gosh, I moved here from, from you know, yada, 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 and I don't have a bus. Well, where'd you move from? Well, the Upper East Side of Chicago. Well, yeah, no kidding. You moved to Pebble Creek. Right? I mean, come on. The, the, the densities aren't the same they are in Chicago, and so the number of buses aren't as frequent. And so I think if you can have that candid conversation and say, you know what, maybe the bus isn't the solution. Maybe it's a different type of service. So as that autonomous vehicle comes online and other things, we can start to roll that out. I'm really interested in the senior issue because we have seniors who do not drive or who uh, are even as far up as Cantamia. Mm -hmm. They cannot get down to us, and um, I know the mayor and I had a conversation two years ago at an event when I cornered him and said, I need you to help us figure out how we can provide more services to seniors, and, and he said and we, you would, and, so here we <laughs> mayor, are. Councilman Cameron, we, we you. can do that, uh, Good. you know. We and just we need to figure it out. I don't know if we can right. afford it or if we can come up with a solution that we offer them to tell them how to do it, and so we, they know it's all of the above. do it. The, as, as one of the one of the exciting things about, as, as Rob said, about transportation now is there's all these different models and modes that are combining. We have a basic need, and we have different ways we can solve the problem. Uh, money is always an issue. Sure. Uh, also, I think what we found in in, in the frankly with the regional uh, paratransit is that you can't give someone basically a blank check to ride and say no. go ever. There there's a joint coming together and say where do you need to go? If you have a dialysis. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is what we found. Uh, you know, nothing. I think taking people to their dialysis or doctor's appointment is wonderful. But we have to have now people. People said, "Oh, great! I can move from Mesa to Goodyear and keep my doctor in Mesa." Well, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of wonderful doctors you pass on the way, but they literally would change. I've been waiting to move to Goodyear. 
so I could, so I could uh, uh, enjoy Pebble Creek, but I want to keep my doctor uh, by Leisure World in Mesa, and they go 40 miles uh, for four dollars. So there's some, there's some things we're working on, but it's 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 exciting because there's a lot of different answers to that question. Well, I appreciate your input. Uh, we were on a timeline tonight because we have another meeting, but I want to thank you uh, because I think what this says to us, first of all, Council. Uh, we, we haven't begun the actual Prop 500. We're still talking about the leftover 400 and how things are going. Uh, but I, I give you this promise that we will keep you abreast of what's going on at these meetings. Have our assistant put the paper out and we'll get it out to them and, and you also to tell them. And then I think we have an assignment and our assignment is that we want to start getting this information out to the public. So the public is starting to chatter about this mm -hmm. and talk about the possibilities. So we've got places to put the articles in. We can talk about it. Nothing's in stone, but hey, listen, what do you think, okay? And we can't thank you tonight. This has thank been you. wonderful. You can see how hungry the council was to hear these things. Um, so we appreciate your, your presence here and staff. Thank you very much for what you do and how you do it. It's nice to see an old friend mayor and it's nice yeah. to see uh, an old council person that we, yeah. when I got on, uh, nice to have Rob back. was on the council with me. Um, so, um, and it's interesting to see how you've all progressed in your career fields. So congratulations. <laughs> uh, it's nice to see. Progression. <laughs> yes, yes. The, uh, Thank you. And please understand, and, and, and uh, uh, Council Member Stipp is a wonderful board member, but he's not our only, uh, he's not the only conduit. We're more than happy to come out here and talk to any, any of you individually as a group. Thank you. Uh, please let, let, let Bill under, know, and he, he meets with us at least once a month and is very good about letting us Great. know what good year. We appreciate means. that compliment for our representative. Thank you. Well, we're going to adjourn this meeting. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to adjourn it while we're at the table, and we'll come up and shake your hands real quick. Uh, so we're going to adjourn this meeting, and then you know the next thing, we're going to call the special meeting to order. So we're going to give a few seconds between that. All right, this meeting is adjourned.